thanks to everybody uh, who is here in the audience and also online. And thank you to our wonderful panel that uh, maybe is a record for how many people we've had on this stage before. Um, before we get into the, the topic of fintech and financial services and really the disruption that we're seeing, uh, I wanted to make sure that everybody got a chance to know um, who each of you are really quickly. Um, so if we can, can we just uh, start and introduce yourself and, and your title, please? Yes, uh, thank you, Jennifer. Uh, my name is Yusuf al and I'm the uh, Chief Executive Officer of the Qatar Financial Center, which is a financial and business center uh, to develop the financial services industry in Qatar. I'm Bob Diamond. Um, I'm founder and chief executive of Atlas Merchant Capital, which is an investment firm um, focused on the developed economies and financial services. Um, hello, everybody. My name is Katarina Jäger. I'm head of the MENA region for Galaxy Digital. Galaxy Digital um, follows a merchant bank model and is one of the global leaders in the crypto and blockchain space. Hello, I am uh, Mohammed Al Khatar. I am the founder and uh, general partner of uh, McCann Ventures, a venture capital fund. Naveen Gupta, managing director for Ripple for MENA in South Asia, um, and it's great to be here. J.K. Khalil, I'm the general manager of uh, MENA East region, which is uh, UAE, Qatar, Kuwait, Oman, Pakistan, pretty much GCC and Pakistan at MasterCard. Happy to be here. Hi, Somitra Sehgal. You can call me Som, that's S-A-U-M. <laughs> Partner with Roland Berger, based here in Qatar, Doha, and focusing on financial services. Hi, I'm Paul Susnet, CEO and co-founder of SMD Group. Uh, we're based in uh, Amsterdam, Netherlands, and uh, work, our technology, uh, Pay With Glass, is the infrastructure solution at the core of the upcoming uh, UK retail CBDC pilot. Wonderful. Thank you all so much uh, for, for introducing yourself. So let's just get into it. And I really wanted to start with this statistic that we found to be really interesting uh, within Bloomberg. 64% of consumers worldwide say that they interact with or use fintech in some form, up from 33% in 2017. Um, Yusuf, maybe you start uh, and just let us know what you think has really been sort of the driver and the catalyst in more and more adoption that we're seeing with fintech. Well, uh, thank you, Jennifer. It's a pleasure to be here in the uh, Qatar Economic Forum, and I welcome all our guests here uh, in, in, in Qatar. Um, if we look at uh, technology and, and financial services, I think uh, uh, fintech is actually redrawing the financial services industry, just like tech is redrawing every other industry. But the trend uh, I've been noticing uh, uh, from my position in the government uh, regulating and embracing and attracting uh, fintech companies into uh, the Qatar Financial Center and the state of Qatar as a whole, what I'm seeing is that uh, most of the financial services institutions now are embracing uh, disruption and are becoming self-disruptors uh, themselves. Five years back, uh, I was dealing with tech companies who wanted to basically register themselves in the Qatar financial centers to come in and disrupt the entire market without uh, having to deal with the financial institutions already operating in the market who have been around for 20, 30, uh, 40 years, you name it. So this shift, uh, I think, uh, where financial institutions want to become self-disruptors tells you that uh, existing uh, institutions are actually embracing uh, technology. So we've seen a lot of uh, acquisitions uh, between financial institutions and technological companies. What we're seeing uh, as well is that uh, most of the uh, blue chip financial institutions are partnering with existing uh, technological companies. FinTech companies, of course, need customers. Financial institutions need data, so it's a win-win uh, situation. So during that trend, we've taken a liberal approach at the Qatar Financial Center to allow uh, most fintech companies uh, across multiple uh, service lines to uh, establish themselves and, and, and register themselves in the financial center without any uh, regulations. And the idea there was that if you are a technological company doing, providing a certain technology, then we would treat it as an ICT company and have them basically experiment with the technology, 
and try to uh, sell it to financial institutions. If it was uh, providing credit or taking deposits, now that's a more uh, a gray area. They would be uh, forced and mandated to go deal with existing infrastructure, which is already regulated uh, in the market. So what I'm seeing is the partnership model is, uh, is uh, taking place uh, in the market. We have more than 65 uh, fintech companies uh, currently in the financial center, and most of them leverage upon existing infrastructure uh, in the industry. Bob, do you agree with that? Is it more of a collaborative effort that you're seeing? Yeah, I do, and I think it's it's kind of has an 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 inevitability to it. Um, mm -hmm. You know, I, I um, it hit me very very clearly when we we made a decision in Atlas to merge with Circle. Circle simply stated is the U.S. digital coin. It's a stable coin, and you know if you go back a few years, and I was going to send a hundred million dollars from my firm in New York. Uh, to Yusuf here, you know, you start by calling your bank. Uh, the bank will say, well, maybe what day's today, Tuesday, maybe we can get that out Thursday, Thursday afternoon. We have some things to do. And at the end of that, you'd pay two, two and a half points for the, for the trouble. <clears throat> with, you know, um, crypto native digital with the internet um, and with a digital coin, you can now do it instantaneously. We can do it right here between each other. Um, it moves at the speed of light, um, and we're driving the cost to practically zero. And if all of that's true, then banks can't survive in their current state. So to, f to build on what Yusuf is saying is I think there's two incredibly powerful forces at work. None of it will happen overnight, but if you look out over three to five years, then the conventional banks, um, Europe, UK, US, who are taking deposits and making loans and want to keep this, you know, corporate treasury type of business are going to have to cannibalize and adopt digital. If they don't, they will fail. And I think people are beginning to accept that. But what they haven't accepted yet is it's equally true on the other side. For Circle as an example, for them to succeed, they have to embrace regulation and probably become regulated banks. And that's not kind of in the, in the market yet for most crypto firms. So we are very much applying to become a regulated bank. And I think, I think there's going to be a lot more regulation needed, smart regulation on the digital side. And I think there's going to be a real cannibalization of the infrastructure on the legacy banking side. Let's talk about infrastructure. Paul, I know you had mentioned that that is something that needs to be addressed before we can even see any more sort of ad adoption or innovation. What, what specifically, in terms of infrastructure, do you need to see? So I think uh, one of the biggest challenges we have today is the fact that the banking sector and uh, payment sector in general is very fragmented. We're looking at a dozen different standards and different ways of moving things, a legacy that goes back 50 years. It's not prepared for the digital currency world. And we need to approach this with a blank canvas and basically state, okay, when we were looking at, the, uh, when ARPANET was created, when ARPA was making the internet, they didn't start by looking at the telecommunications lines for telegram, uh, tel telegraph lines and saying, let's add some new features. They started from scratch. There were a different set of uh, needs at the time, a different set of uh, requirements that they had to fulfill. And that's where the internet that we know today came from. And we need to do exactly the same thing when it comes to digital currency infrastructure. We need to start from scratch, look at the requirements, look at the needs, look at the challenges, and build from the ground up. It cannot be bolt-ons. So my background is in the telecommunications space, and uh, I have applied that type of thinking to the infrastructure solution my company's created. And uh, we're also doing this through a public-private partnership. So it, it's not just about one company doing it. It has to be a collaboration bringing the best of minds together to create this new infrastructure, this digital financial market infrastructure. And that's the approach we've taken with the, the first retail CBDC pilot in the UK under Project New Era. Sam, I see you nodding your head over there. Yes, absolutely. Uh, as Paul said, I think uh, this has been a, a challenge for banks for quite some while, right? Uh, as uh, Yusuf mentioned earlier, banks have done quite a bit in terms of trying to digitize themselves, make sure that customers are getting the right sort of experiences, but there are definitely constraints that they have. And essentially, it is the legacy system and networks that they have built over a period of time. Uh, can you really overhaul them 
in one go? The answer is no. There's a lot of unwinding to do. And therefore, new forms of infrastructure, whether it be new core banking systems or banking as a service, these play a very big part now in accelerating existing incumbent institutions to move more digital. The other interesting play on infrastructure is, uh, I'll, I'll refer to what uh, Bob also mentioned, that even for fintech players who really want to expand their remit, they need some sort of infrastructure. They also need some capabilities because it's, at the end of the day, the financial services business is also a risk management business. That's not something that the fintechs are very good at. They have not seen cycles yet. Now they're starting to see a cycle, but they've not seen that yet. That is where banks and existing financial institutions can actually help, whether it is providing their own uh, infrastructure in the middle of its licenses or even the risk management capability. So interestingly, infrastructure is both a play for uh, banks, but it's also uh, a constraint when you want to move completely digital. Who would you say is doing it right? JK, maybe you jump in because MasterCard, a, a traditional banking service, uh, it, are there innovations that you and your team are working on that you feel like are successfully Plenty. hitting at this? Uh, <laughs> so yeah, I mean, you, you probably, we, we call it the original FinTech, right? MasterCard, I mean, when, when, when wires and, and money movement came, came, became a, a thing consumer can do on a, on a daily basis when they go to a restaurant 60 years ago. So, um, you know, fast forward 50 years ago, like that's 10 years ago, basically, if, if, I, if I got the math right. Um, we decided that, first of all, cards cannot be the way to get rid of cash in the ecosystem and to enable people to pay and get paid. So we changed MasterCard's strategy to become a multi-rail strategy. What that means is we don't necessarily, I, mean, I know card is part of the MasterCard brand, but forget that part. We not only like enable cards, uh, we enable account-to-account -account payments. So we acquired, if you remember a few years ago, Vocalink, which is the largest account-to-account -account, uh, you know, sort of platform globally. And now we have 15 or 19, 15 live implementations, 19, if you count the ones uh, work in progress globally in 19 different economies and, and countries, basically. Uh, we also invested heavily a few years back on the remittance side um, and uh, acquired a few companies along the way, the, the, the most recent one of them being TransFast. So we're enabling also that movement of, of money and funds from you know, expats back to their home countries. Uh, we're heavily invested on the gateway side uh, because we also enable 90 million merchants. And that number, I think, almost doubled, if I remember, from pre to post COVID, because most merchants who had brick and mortar had to be included in the digital economy to even survive. Um, and even as far as recently, you may remember, we've invested quite a bit in uh, open banking. So we acquired uh, Finicity in the US and Aya and Nordics, out of Nordics. And the whole idea is to also enable new use cases, not just on the payment side, but on you know, payment initiation, uh, information sharing, and basically pretty much everything on the open banking side. So we see that there is a lot that we can do as an organization because we are a network organization by design. We connect to 25,000 banking institutions. We connect to, uh, like I said, 90 million odd merchants. And increasingly so, and as part of our most recent evolution within the organization, now we, we kind of, our front end is multi-segment, right? So we just don't only focus on FIs, focus on FIs, we focus on fintechs, we focus on telcos, we focus on merchants and, and governments as well. We believe that all of them have an equal sort of stake in enabling the ecosystem. And what we try to do, because we are connected to those ecosystem and we are permissioned as an organization to operate in more than 200 markets, right? So we try to help all these fintechs and all new participants kind of understand the local regulation, the lay of the land, but also think about how to scale and how to connect the ecosystem across borders. Mm -hmm. and, and hence, as we connect into them and allow them to connect into us, sometimes consume our APIs or teach them how to consume APIs of our partners, in a way we kind of help level the playing field and bring in more participants and more innovators and disruptors into the global ecosystem. Katerina, jump in here. Um, yeah, financial inclusion is definitely something that um, I'm personally very passionate about, but um, also our company and our founder, um, I think Mike Monovogratz, um, realized um, that fintech is driving this financial inclusion. And um, in the last decade, we've seen 1.2 billion people um, globally um, gaining access to financial services. Um, but we still have a long way to go. We still have 1.7 billion people um, who are currently unbanked. And I think um, a forum like the Qatar Economic Forum is a great platform since you know, we have such a global audience. Um, but technology is disrupting a lot of different fields. Um, but I think key to change is always adoption. Um, so for us, especially institutional adoption, um, 
is uh, something that we're, um, yeah, that's our purpose really to um, bring more investors into the space and give them secure access, institutional grade access, um, because we feel like that will then help these fintech companies to innovate further, to become um, safer as well. I mean, obviously right now with the current um, market conditions, we see some of the weaker players um, being wiped out, but some of the stronger ones will definitely survive and continue, uh, continue to optimize these new emerging business models. So, yeah. Where are we seeing gaps right now in terms of where there needs to still be um, adjustments to the way things are working, when it, whether that's cross-border payments, um, infrastructure, regulation? Uh, Mohammed, maybe you jump in. Yeah, sure. So um, I would like to say that um, there are a number of challenges for fintech to really be um, uh, taken um, uh, into uh, consideration and fostered in an economy. Mm -hmm. uh, one of the more major ones for a number of uh, jurisdictions is regulation. Um, the financial services is a very sensitive uh, sector. You're dealing with uh, people's money, uh, highly regulated as it should be, uh, but it needs to be open enough to allow for uh, technology companies to iterate, uh, learn, uh, and be able to try out uh, new uh, technologies that will create value uh, not only to the end customer, but uh, to even the current businesses that are running right now. We discussed a few of the ways in which these financial services companies actually um, uh, collaborate with the fintech uh, sector, but it goes uh, uh, levels deeper. So there are APIs, which is basically the language that technology companies use to talk to one another, um, and that allows for things like um, Siri to... Um, you talk to Siri and say, PayPal, send my bill. You know, it builds on top of what it currently exists. And then there's open banking, which my uh, fellow panelist uh, Khalil uh, just mentioned. Um, that allows you to extract data from uh, these uh, customers' information in actual financial services. And that data can be used to provide value to the end customer. For the financial services company, this is great because, you know, you're providing value for no uh, acquisition cost for, for the customer. And then there is banking as a service, which is this whole new um, uh, uh, way of these financial services to offer their services uh, to fintech companies uh, to um, allow them to provide their own services as if they're regulated because they don't see the money themselves. It goes through a regulated entity, but they become the front end um, of it. And, and, and that allows them to uh, provide services at a much lower cost um, than um, uh, a number of the current um, uh, legacy players, if you will. Um, and, uh, you know, believe it or not, there are some legacy players that simply um, do not want, which is one of the other uh, challenges, I think, do not want to believe that these technology companies are actually a threat. Uh, and so they stay on course, and I believe in, uh, that uh, they will uh, go extinct uh, over time. Um, uh, technology is disrupting every sector, as Catherine said, uh, but it will definitely, uh, and it currently is. Uh, there are many examples. Circle is one of them, many others uh, that we currently use, uh, and this is just um, a fraction of what will, I think the fintech now takes 1% of total addressable market of, of, of the financial services. It will take uh, a lot more in, in the coming years. So is it, uh, is it a threat then to traditional uh, financial institutions on, on the whole, or is it more about em embracing it? Bob or Naveen, I'd love for you to jump yeah, in. Yeah, I can jump in. And we can go a little bit, a couple of levels deeper, because yeah. otherwise we'll be at the, at the surface, right? Uh, so what is causing this change? So at least from one use case that we can see, so crypto trades 24-7, 365 days a year. That means on a Sunday night, you can essentially buy a Bitcoin, Ethereum, XRP, USDC if you wanted to. So what opportunity does it create? The opportunity it creates is normally when money moves around the world, if you look at remittances, which is about $150 trillion of money movement cross-border, say if you're sending mo money from GBP to Philippines Peso, GPP goes into US dollar, US dollar goes into Philippines peso. That's how the money traditionally moves. And in that, there is something called as Nostro or Vostro accounts, and that's about five to $10 trillion of trapped capital 
that ascending institution has to keep with the receiving institutions to make that money flow possible, right? And that's almost the large majority of the cost, the capital cost and the depreciation risk, which comes in a remittance when essentially moves money, money moves from GBP to Philippines peso in this, this case. But if you were to use a crypto asset in the middle, which is a 24-7 market, then you're moving money from, say, GBP to USDC to Philippines peso or GBP to XRP to Philippines peso, in our case, for example. And in that case, the trapped capital is zero. You're able to send money 12 o'clock in the night at an instant rate at almost a very minimal cost for the customer. Now, this is a radical shift in the way traditional money markets work, which work Monday to Friday, for example, in the, in the UK time zone, Monday to Friday in a Philippines time. Philippines time zone. As blockchain sort of, as, as, as one big technology leap destroys these Monday to Friday markets and makes you 24-7, there will be a lot of new business models that will evolve. Almost like post office, right? You may remember all the post offices used to work Monday to Friday. You put in your mail and it'll get delivered two days later. Then came email. You press a button and now we can send email to everybody 24-7, 365 days a year. Now that infrastructure, very few institutions will decide to become front runners and take advantage of it. And it doesn't matter, it's a fintech or a bank, but institutions that do, they will become the next Amazon, Facebook, Googles of the world, and everybody else will be left behind because uh, they will get a dominant market share based on this new infrastructure that is getting created. I used to work um, 15 years at traditional financial institutions, and large business in a traditional financial institution is the ability to manage this mismatch. Um, Bob sent me money in UK time zone, I'm receiving it in the Philippines time zone, and the only reason the institution exists is because we are in two different time zones. Now, if that is not there, then a lot of business models itself will become irrelevant, mm -hmm. and that's something to watch out, but also the opportunity is huge to essentially, like he said, to, in this fragmented space to essentially consolidate and bigger companies to emerge. Who should be regulating that, though? Yusuf, uh, you want to? No, Yusuf, you want to jump in? <laughs> Which no, part of that? It, it, oh, it's yeah. not as much a who. I mean, you know, the, the, the debate in the U.S. with the Gillibrand um, proposal now, is it the CFTC, is it the SEC? Um, one thing's for sure, we need regulation. And I think there's this misnomer that you know, digital is trying to avoid regulation. We're screaming for it. You know, with Circle, we are regulated, but we're regulated by 50 states, 50 different ways. And we need federal regulation. And we saw the failure of a stable coin in Terra recently that should have been regulated. That's not a stable coin. If it had an arithmetic or some kind of, of, uh, of way to hold security behind the digital currency, then that's not stable. Um, you know, in, in um, USDC, we have $55 billion outstanding. In the last year, we've redeemed $108 billion. So there's been a constant turnover, and every time a dollar's been a dollar's been a dollar, because we have every dollar backed by three-month treasuries or cash, 80% cash. Regulation, I mean, and that's not known to the public, but regulation should be enforcing that if you're a stablecoin, that you are safe and that you're not going to run into a, you know, a breaking of the buck or a run on the bank or, or something like that. So whether it's the CFTC or the SEC is not as important as there needs to be um, smart regulation in this space. And it's why the institutional investors are not in there. It's why banks can't be lending to crypto right now. And this is just not, it's not acceptable. The regulators need to step up. And I think you know, we embrace that. Um, we're trying to work with the regulators in, in, in Congress to get them moving, but, but you know, you're spot on. That's the next key thing um, uh, for the success. Yeah, the digital. easiest way to think about it, Bree, there would be need to be a lead regulator in the home country of that particular company, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. And then everybody else aligns themselves to that particular regulator. And generally, maybe it'll start with, say, for example, US, UK, Japan, Singapore, some of the larger markets and then maybe the G7 essentially say, hey, you know what, this is sensible, and then we can align to that fact. Because getting one single regulation across all large major developing economies in one go or developed economies in one go possibly is unlikely to happen. Yeah, in terms of, uh, if, if you look at, uh, for example, uh, uh, blockchain, for example, or let's take, let's take crypto in terms of regulation. 
so many countries have banned it, other countries are looking to regulate it. It really depends on what the outlook uh, for crypto is. Is it going to be a medium of exchange or is it going to continue to trade as a commodity? If it continues to trade as a commodity, then you're actually trading the technology. You'll always have this volatility. Um, I don't see in the near term any uh, governments, uh, with the exception of probably one country in uh, South America, I don't see any uh, countries adopting uh, crypto as a medium of exchange. And I've, I've, what I see is a trend that central banks are going to start issuing digital currencies. And I think treating crypto as a medium of exchange, the story itself will, will probably uh, die out. In terms of other uh, regulations uh, regarding uh, other parts of uh, fintech, like I said, the existing infrastructure, I think, within financial institutions allows for at least 50% of the technology to become regulated within the existing infrastructure. So, for example, uh, one of the problems we had in Qatar was um, uh, the unbankable population. We had around 1.2 million laborers unable to basically open bank accounts. So that is a problem that the financial, uh, existing financial inst institutions didn't want to touch because it was, it was costly to basically set up bank accounts for a thousand dollars for a thousand dollar paycheck at the end of the month. So the telecom com uh, companies stepped in with their mobile payment solutions and have taken over the entire 1.2 million digital uh, wallets, uh, allowing remittances back to their home countries. So you have a non-financial institution stepping in, solving a problem in the financial industry, and benefiting the entire society. So that's financial inclusion that happened within an existing regulatory framework because at the end of the day, it's the exchanges teaming up with the telecom companies, with the fintech companies, allowing for uh, remittances to happen in a more swift and digital uh, format. So you know, some of it is already regulated, and I think the markets will adapt and take advantage of that. And, uh, another example on an area that probably is an issue in Qatar and will probably start needing regulation is, uh, if we look at the real estate uh, sector, for example, it's currently oversupplied, and we have an issue in terms of valuations and pricing, despite, you know, uh, having the World Cup in six months. Residential uh, apartments and complexes are doing well, but there's other segments and parts of the real estate market that has been suffering since 2017. But not 80 to 85 percent of the real estate market is not accessible to your regular man on the street. So tokenizing real estates becomes a plausible solution to address uh, that problem. So creating regulations around uh, digital assets and tokenization would be required to address that uh, problem. So uh, you know, we're, we're taking the view that we would look at the market, how it reacts, and then step in if regulations are required. If regulations are not required, then we must basically take advantage of the existing infrastructure, which works. Uh, for the uh, financial services industry. If you're a bank, you probably have a license for taking deposits and uh, giving out credit. If you're a technological company or a fintech company who wants to do that digitally, then you can team up with a local bank and uh, leverage upon their access to the payment and clearing system and digitize probably a portion of the services that the bank wants to provide to their customers. So I think that approach works for a small market like Qatar. And I see a trend also building up in other countries where regulations are probably slow. How does that happen, though, in emerging economies? And when we think of uh, the MENA region, for instance, um, where there's still a lot of fragmentation, I mean, how do you make it work? Uh, Sam? Yeah. So I think if you look at fintechs and how they really operate, I think there are a couple of great things that they do. One is, of course, they are very customer-centric, they're very product-oriented, so they operate very differently from fintechs, and that actually alludes to the first question that you had, Jennifer, that how is it that they're successful? But the other important thing to note is also fintechs tend to play on the edge of regulation, right? They see a regulatory gray space, uh, and if that regulatory gray space allows them to build an innovative product and service, they tend to operate in that. 
uh, that space itself. So regulations typically tend to try and play catch up with what is really happening on the fintech side. Fintechs innovate much faster than regulations can catch up, um, but it also puts a lot of pressure uh, sometimes. A classic case that we've seen recently, uh, the sort of most fancied word last year around the world in fintech was BNPL. Uh, now, if you look at some of the biggest players, we know what's happening there. Uh, what was missed in this entire piece is what Yusuf, you said earlier, that there are parts of fintech which are still not regulated by the traditional regulations. For example, if you have a BNPL, yes, it is expanding the pie. There are a lot many more people getting credit, but there are also a lot many more people defaulting. So as a regulator, you'd be concerned that are people getting overburdened with debt by BNPL. It's currently not part of the system. So the regulator needs to then start thinking, how do I take that into the current framework? How do I start capturing that information? And that's something that regulators need to do all the time. So the way that fintechs operate, unfortunately, regulators will always have to play catch up and keep looking on any systemic uh, risks that emerge. Wow. Yeah. I mean, that's why I see a big opportunity for the MENA region, because um, from my personal experience over the last few months, the regulators here in the MENA region are very proactive. Um, they listen, and I think they're not trying to fit regulations into an existing body, and um, that is very well perceived. I mean, by a global company like Galaxy Digital, we work with regulators all across the world, um, a full-time employee in Washington, just to kind of educate regulators as well and um, advise policymakers. And I think um, this could really come, become a competitive advantage for the region because I think there was always um, the desire to, um, to create a financial hub, um, to bring talent to the region. And now this talent, especially in the blockchain um, space, is looking for a home. So you already see, you know, companies moving from Hong Kong and Singapore, um, for example, to the UAE. Um, but I think the whole region has such a momentum now to, um, to listen, to invite people to the table um, and to find solutions. Um, so that's where I see the government's vision um, to be open for innovation and to be part of it um, versus playing catch up and rather taking the stand of, oh, we want to manage our risk. Right, that's usually how regulators think. So I think there's a big change in mindset, um, and the the people who are bold now and who really uh, work with the the private sector as well, I think will um, have a big uh, yeah advantage in the future. Paul? I have a slightly different or maybe mildly controversial view on this. I think one of the challenges we face here is we're staring at these problems over and over again for a very long time, and there's the risk of becoming very myopic as a result. What we need to do is take a step back and look at the bigger picture. There are two things at play here. Uh, we're looking at massive transition from the old banking and payments world to the new digital currency world. Digital assets of all types being able to move around, new opportunities and so forth emerging. There is the balance that has to be maintained between stability, consumer protection through regulation, but also regulation cannot stifle innovation. And I think in order to maintain that balance, if we take a step back and look at, okay, there is an opportunity. Obviously, we cannot change regulation overnight. We can't change infrastructure overnight. It's not feasible in the real world. But there is a global opportunity as central banks move towards central bank issued digital cash, CBDCs, where regulation has to change. In most markets, CBDCs are not legal tender until regulation and, and legislation changes. There is the opportunity for the entire world to look at things differently, move the, the regulatory uh, needle into a position where it finds that balance between innovation and consumer protection and stability. Now, that's number one. The second thing is, if we look at this from an infrastructure standpoint, and I, I know I keep harping on about that, but that, that is the area that we know very well. Uh, if you look at this from an infrastructure standpoint, there is much to be learned from the companies that have been around for a very long time running networks. There is much to be learned from those who have disrupted that space. There's much to be learned from the existing uh, you know, incumbent banks and so forth. And there's much to be learned from the new wildcard thinkers. And I think what needs to happen is the private sector needs to go into a mode of co-opetition where we learn from each other, we put the best in class into the pool, and then we work hand in hand with the regulators with a private-public partnership. This is the way to actually solve that problem and find that balance moving forward. And the opportunity is now in, this, in the, the emergence of CBDCs. 
JK, I saw you nodding. Uh, I mean, I kind of tend to agree with that. I mean, I mean not necessarily the CBDCs yet, <laughs> but the, the prior portion, which is where you said we need to kind of competition, I think is key. To be honest with you, that's exactly like the kind of thinking, at least we take, uh, uh, with, you know, uh, within MasterCard internally, um, we bring that legacy knowledge and we're not afraid to ingest an experiment. I mean, we've, we've acquired you know, dozens of companies every year for the last 10 years. Let's be honest, some of them won't work. Some of them will actually die upon arrival, kind of you know, uh, too big, too small, nimble, not nimble. It's, it's, you know, so it's a bit of cultural shift, correct. Because a lot of them are like product fit kind of experiments. Uh, many of them die when they actually hit the markets. They say, okay, this worked in the US, it's not gonna work in Europe, not gonna work in Asia, and so on and so forth, and vice versa. But I think the right way to think about it, and I think I take pride in the fact that this is how MasterCard thinks about it. I think that is the role that every large organization, especially digital companies, should do. I mean, uh, like the Apples and the Amazons of the world, and I think they, they probably do it much more comfortably. They don't, even not coming at it from a fintech perspective as we do, but at least you know they're a bit more, uh, let's say, experimental, experiential about it, is to bring in the new, put it with the old, and see this kind of like uh, uh, sort of this creative destruction kind of process take place and see what comes out of it. Because when you take something so new like a CBDC to take an example or any blockchain technology and plug it into an existing you know, platform that is regulated and permissioned in 200 markets that knows regulation that has, we have like an industry of a franchise and lawyers inside the company, then you see actually how it will do in the new world. And if it doesn't, it's not that we're just going to kill it just outright, right? Sometimes we, we take a look at it and say, wait, this has to work. If it's not working, we need to start talking to regulators. And that's why we have actually at MasterCard a very, very proactive way uh, to dealing with policy, to talking to regulators, to engaging uh, part market participants as well as uh, uh, authorities and try to co-create with them, figure out where things sit um, and try to, to build this, you know, let's say an improved front end of the regulation or a smarter regulation or whatever you want to call it so that we can fit sort of, uh, uh, you know, these new innovations on top of the existing uh, network that we have built over the last but decades. The key here is that it should not be a single company pushing for the regulators to make the change. It I needs agree. to be the industry. I agree. So that, that's the approach we've taken with Project New Era in the UK. For the UK retail CBDC pilot, Project New Era is an industry initiative. So one company pushing this means there's going to be a bias. Absolutely. Someone's going to get burned somewhere. Industry initiatives basically mean that the regulator is regulating the industry, and they're hearing from the very people that are going to be on the other side of this. So that, that's really key to this. I agree. Okay. But I think in one word, if I were to sum up, some it like at least the policymakers or regulators need to become more entrepreneurial, also, right? Yeah. <laughs> uh, that's the way, right? I mean, Are you inside, optimistic about that? yeah. I mean, but but that's that's where the world is headed. To my mind, there is no way they can have a good understanding of all technologies. It's coming. I mean, it's AI, machine. I mean, you'll name it. It'll it is coming to them in all directions, right? The only way to do this is, and some regulators have tried to do it through sandbox, is to say, hey, I'll do small experiments and I'll build towards that big launch. Otherwise, it'll always be one versus another. Yep. But, but uh, I don't think it's only the regulations. It's also uh, regulators adopting technology for their own processes and automation and KYC and compliance. They will eventually have to embrace this so that they can operate in a more efficient, dynamic uh, manner. So I think you know the regulatory part will eventually catch up. They will embrace it, adopt it, and eventually... Uh, catch up with the with the industry, and like I said, parts of it is already uh, regulated. But I think, you know, regu uh, regulations is one part of the ecosystem. There's the talent part. There's the uh, lifestyle. Like you said, there's many hubs today uh, globally. Uh, with the current war in Russia and Ukraine, you have basically people looking for neutral destinations for their fintech companies, and we're seeing uh, basically a move for certain uh, Baltic and Russian companies into the East rather than the West. So which countries are going to be able to embrace uh, Russian tech companies? So, you know, there's a lot of dynamics at play, and I think regulations is only one part of it. The talent, lifestyle, uh, allowing basically uh, immigration and, and processes for uh, registration of new fintech companies should also be uh, easy uh, and embracing as well. The extreme example of that is central bank digital currencies. Mm -hmm. There's this assumption that um, you know, the Federal Reserve and the US should develop their own central bank digital currency. But they're not the people to attract talent. They're not the people who have innovated. They're regulators. And we want them to be regulators. 
Um, the Fed did not invent the Fed wire. The Fed wire was invented by the private sector and then um, regulated by the central bank. Um, the Federal Reserve did not create SWIFT. That was the private sector and then regulated. And we need this regulation because if we counted on the, on the Fed to develop a central bank digital currency, we'd be waiting for 5, 10, 15, 20 years, and it probably would not be the best version of itself. Allow the private sector, many, many private actors, to compete to develop the best digital currency and then regulate it. And I think that's the model. And we, we jump to this conclusion that we're waiting for the Fed to develop it. That's a bad model. Mohammed? Yeah, I think uh, there is a, 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 an, an interesting point that I would like to raise that adds to what has just been said, which is if you look at fintech right now, and technology as a whole, but let's focus on fintech, it actually increases the total addressable market for the financial services. It doesn't just take away from what the pie that currently exists. It increases the pie. And that has a number of effects um, from a regulatory perspective um, uh, uh, and, and from the current players. And, and uh, if they look at it that way, it will incentivize them actually to try to capture this increase in pie that can be taken by other jurisdictions and other regulators that, that uh, uh, can adopt it faster. Um, and uh, I, I think a, a very good example of this um, uh, is a, a company called uh, Tala that offers microfinancing to the unbankable, to the ones that have no financial identity. Uh, they offer financing of up to $500 by reading your phone's data. You apply, and within minutes, you get a loan um, um, in Kenya, India, Philippines, and Mexico. And they do that by reading 2,000 data points. And through statistical modeling, machine learning, um, they actually can say uh, that there's, for example, a correlation that says uh, if you have a large net social network and you contact them consistently, uh, there's a 9% higher chance of repayment. Um, so this is a market that was untouched by the legacy players at, at all. Uh, it was not there. Uh, through fintech, it just suddenly is a, a market that currently exists. They can insure it. They can uh, profit from it. Uh, and it, it, it does social good as well. Um, and I think if regulators see that, um, it, it, they will embrace it more. And then the other um, aspect uh, is customers. Customers are demanding this. And the more the customers demand it, the more the regulators will have to, to listen. Because they will find ways uh, to use it. Uh, um, so these uh, were the points I wanted to make. I think there are a couple of points that uh, you've touched on that also need to be addressed when it comes to regulation in this new world. Data is, is key. Data is everything today. But there is a major thing that, that uh, most regulators are not up to speed on or not really prepared for, and they need to bring that talent into the house. Uh, how do you regulate the data uh, brokers? How do you regulate the companies that have more data on you than any other entity has ever had in history? And how do you make sure that data is not abused, it's not used? You know, you, I mean, in today's world, you are the product because your data is what's being sold. And if you don't have the regulation in place to, first of all, if the regulators don't fully understand what the risks are, how can they regulate the space to make sure the data is not abused? The second challenge we have here is that the regulatory space is a minefield. You have a different set of regulations in every different market around the world, and then every institution in each market has its own risk appetite. So there's no standard. If you're going to move, if you're going to move into a world where you're looking at the exchange of data across borders, across time zones, across, you know, it doesn't really matter, 24-7, you need a, some sort of global agreement on what the regulatory standards are, and you also need to make sure that agreement takes into account the use of, the storage of, and the management of private citizens' data in every jurisdiction. That's the challenge. I, I think, as, as Devin said, they, the regulators need to be entrepreneurs and they need to take risk. The reality is there will be bad actors, and these bad actors will do bad things, and the regulators will be blamed. But the reality is the ultimate gain of allowing this experimentation to happen is that they will iterate as it goes along, as most regulations do. The thing is we cannot 
stop uh, uh, you know this type of innovation from happening by by thinking about all the things that can go wrong, but really try to um, uh, allow it to happen and then iterating based on what actually happens and as opposed to what we think can happen wrong you know the, the no I, I agree with you we, we don't want to stifle innovation but at the same time let's 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 consider today that we have more regulation around counter terrorist finance uh, financing than many of the other areas in financial services yeah. We need to do the same thing when it comes to data and privacy protection, because at the end of the day, if there is no jurisdiction that a company can move to, to not have to abide by the rules on how they, they treat uh, personal data, you know, it means that every company has to step its game up. It has to make sure they have the, regular, the right tools in place to protect data from cybersecurity to resilience to make, to, uh, to make sure the data is being handled in a way that protects privacy. I mean, ultimately, we want self-sovereignty of data, but in the real world, that's probably never going to happen. So the next best thing is to make sure that regulators are agreed upon a standard. So there's no jurisdiction a company can say, we're going to go to because we don't have to worry about uh, what the regulator there thinks about what we do with people's data, and then we're going to sell it to the highest bidder, or we don't secure it properly. Because once that data is out there, there's no, you know, there's no undo button on that. It, it's, there's no coming back. So it needs to be protected from day one. And I was, I was going to say, uh, and, and you're raising two very good points, so just to make sure that everybody gets it. This is like data privacy and cybersecurity, which is, I think, the other point yeah. that Hamad was raising. And I think they're both equally important. But to be fair, also, we are seeing that regulators are more and more talking about and quite concerned and actively doing something about them. I would say more on the cybersecurity side, and I think data privacy is coming right after that, at least in this part of the world. Um, but, but putting that apart, I think not to just hammer too much on regulatory. There's two kinds of like fintech innovations that are happening right now, right? Some of, the, some of them are actually more about the front end, the customer experience, the inclusion. I mean, just at MasterCard, we, we, we set uh, a target to like include, I think, a billion consumer in five years. And we ended up doing 675 million in just like two years. And I think that's thanks to COVID. But we didn't have to change any regulation. Right? So this is all, there's already a secular shift that's happening super quickly. I think the outcome of that is we all have to be much more aware about the private uh, data and the privacy aspect. Cybersecurity is something we invest billions of dollars because I agree with both of you. I think without it, the whole trust system will just collapse and we'll go back to using you know, uh, shells and, uh, and fiat, uh, you know, uh, hard currency. Uh, you know. So I think this is just, it's very important to, to also be mindful of those changes that are not necessarily pushing regulation but creating probably monsters we have to worry about in the future, such as data and cybersecurity. Yeah, and maybe just to close out, Katerina, uh, because we've been talking about the customer and, and this trust factor, right? Mm -hmm. How do you convince customers and consumers that this is actually happening? That, you know, this is something that corporations and financial institutions are really putting forward and putting first as innovation is continuing to evolve? Um, yeah, I think the whole trend of blockchain technology um, was built on the loss of trust, right, in our um, centralized institutions. And so I think now it's more important than ever to earn the trust of the customer, right? And um, I think in organizations where you feel that they are purpose-driven and they're gen genuine, and I think to your example earlier, um, Previously, certain offerings were just not made because it wasn't financially viable or it wasn't financially interesting. Um, and I think with this um, increased transparency, all of a sudden, you know, you, you're looking at unbankable markets and players like MasterCard are incentivized to actually look at these markets and put this as part of their strategic objectives. Um, so I think it's all about like increased transparency, but also definitely from the consumer side, like you very rightly mentioned, um, I think as a consumer, you have so much power that you sometimes don't realize, and I think the reason why we're sitting on this stage today um, is the adoption from the consumers first, which now opens up the doors to conversations with regulators and thereafter institutional investors um, to, yeah, fuel this innovation. So I hope that answers your question. Yeah, there's still a long road ahead, but uh, there's not a lot of time on our clock, so we have to end it here. Thank you all so much for this discussion. It was really fascinating, and thank you all for listening in.